Welcome back to the Composing Made Simple podcast. I'm joined today by Curtis and Chris, as always. And today we thought we would talk about some uh, a few s- subjects that revolve around live streaming and YouTube, since me, Chris, and Curtis, we all kind of delve into that a little bit. And then we're going to go into and break down a trailer piece that Chris actually composed. He wants to really go in and discuss it and how he did it and you know, all that stuff. And then we're going to go in and talk about some sample libraries. Uh, the British Drama Toolkit from Spitfire, ADO Super String, and Cinematic Studio Brass. So we hope you join us for this episode. We hope you enjoy. So let's get on into it. Composing made simple. We talk about something new every show. Composing made simple. Grab a coffee, have a seat, and let's go. So we wanted to talk today a little bit about um, live streaming YouTube, stuff that you do where you're putting out some sort of content that's usually you know video it's maybe you doing some composition or doing a trailer breakdown or a song breakdown um all three of us have sort of dabbled in this space i think some more than others i would definitely call myself more of a dabbler i kind of just do it when i feel like it i know that chris and todd have put some more serious effort into it um but uh yeah what are your approaches in terms of like twitch and youtube do you try to upload on a schedule do you uh try to um you know program it out so that you have a nice great plan for everybody that's all laid out that you can follow or are you like me and you just kind of you know do whatever you feel like which has always been a great recipe for success in my opinion (laughs) um todd what what do you do Uh, what's your approach to this subject yeah, so interesting, uh, at the tail end of last year, um, I was really hitting the YouTube hard. I was uploading a lot and sh- trying to stream more on YouTube because that's where my audience was from the YouTube channel. And I kind of fell into the YouTube music thing. I've done, I've dabbled with YouTube in the past, like uh, I think like over 10 years ago when I first started doing YouTube. I had a tech channel, and I would cover Apple stuff and do all that. This was very early days of YouTube, so the production values weren't like they are today. This was like you know, 2007, 2008. So YouTube was a different atmosphere back then. And you know, people were blowing up. I, mean, I don't know if you guys ever heard of John for Lakers or Shoulder Knows Best. All those guys were starting back then. Um, I had I kind of grew pretty quickly. Not not like a lot. I mean, I think I had like 500, 700, 800 subscribers. I can't remember. You know, at that back then, that was a lot. You know, and you know, I kind of did that through the years, and then I kind of just got sick of. When after Steve Jobs died, I kind of like stopped doing Apple videos, and it kind of got saturated. The market did. Everybody was doing tech stuff. So I kind of like banded it for a while. And then I, um, I actually started doing music stuff. And I, w- I had this great idea of kind of documenting. I was going to try to do like this hard rock EP way back a long time ago. And I was like, oh, let's try to document it like, behind the scenes. And, you know, I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But I did it for a while. And then, you know, I just got like, okay, this is stupid. I'm not very good at it. And I stopped. And then the tail end of, I think it was 2016, when I started getting into the samples and, and stuff like this, I was always out there looking for how to do something. And there wasn't that much content out there, you know, how to like, you know, do MIDI mapping and all this quick tips, quick tip stuff that I kind of do on my channel. So I said, you know what? And I would discover new things. I was like, I'm just going to start putting videos up. And I kind of did it as a, um, I'm an instructional designer, you know, and my day job is that's what I do. And so I kind of put myself as an instructional designer on the other side is like, um, you know, a teacher and like, let's try to teach this stuff so I can get better. You know, so when I'm working with clients or working at my job, instructional designer, I'm a better instructional designer. So that it was kind of a challenge to me. So I kind of just did it and I wasn't really expecting much. I was just kind of doing it for myself. And, you know, cause I figured, Hey, somebody would probably know about this or I can go back and look at my videos. And if I forget how to do something. So that's kind of how it started. And then when I lost my job at the end of 2017, I was like, well, let's try to hit, I had a lot of free time, you know, as one does. And so um, I, was, I just started getting a bunch of ideas and like I, I started doing what I wanted to see other composers and creators do, you know, because I didn't see this stuff out there. You know, like talking to real composers and, 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 and you know, understand how they, they do this for a living because like I'm one of those people who always thought, you know, I come from the rock music, you know, it's like, hey, you go out, you get a, you, you go out, you tour, you do this thing and then eventually you get a record deal and bam, and now you're doing music, you know, which is, not the case today. That's kind of, <laughs> that's dead. Um, so that's kind of how I fell into it. That's like a long winded way. But yeah, so I used to have a schedule. I always wanted to have a video up every week. Um, you know, and I started doing the composer interviews, the composing with coffee. And then it just, I kind of hit a brick wall. And I think as a content creator, 
this happens to a lot of us. And, you know, like the idea is to start running dry or you just start, it just starts getting stale. You know, you're just putting up videos to put videos up and you're not really putting much thought to it. And when it comes to composing, like there's only so much you can talk about and, you know, and then doing the sample library reviews like everybody else does. Like it kind of gets a little, you know, it, it gets a little saturated. Everybody's doing that stuff. So I try to find ways, you know, to be unique. So what about you, Chris? Yeah, I mean... My my story is a lot less uh, eventful than yours, but <laughs> I uh, I started I started at the uh, end of 2017 because actually up to that point I had I've had about like three YouTube channels, but never one that I was really passionate about aside from my like tennis one, um, but none that were like really music related. I had a piano channel which had a a bit of a following on it, but um, I started getting interested in composition, so I was like, okay, why not start a channel for this kind of thing. And so at the end of 2017, I had produced a piece and I started the channel with that piece. And then immediately after the second video, the week after was a uh, breakdown of it. So I kind of wanted to show my intention of it right away. And ever since it's been kind of going in that direction of, you know, original piece followed by a breakdown series of it. And there's also, you know, library reviews in there and some composing tips and stuff. But um, this year I'm, I'm really trying to, I guess do a few less reviews because I want to be able to provide more valuable content to the community instead of, uh, you know, library reviews all the time. Um, and I know that uh, Todd and Curtis have done, you know, ha and have a lot of experience in the live streaming world. But for me personally, I, I've never really considered it just because I get really nervous on the spot. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard sometimes to think, you know, is this going to be good if I'm doing it you know, and, and there's people actually watching me. So that's why I, I feel a lot more secure when I actually uh, do a breakdown of a piece when it's actually completed, then I can actually, you know, go over the stuff I actually, you know, I did and and all that. So I don't know, I, I think it's just like a different approach, but I'm definitely open to trying more live streaming stuff this year. Uh, I've tried to be quite consistent with the channel because I've been able to upload at least a video a week since I started the channel. So I'm hoping that continues and um, that, like even in the tougher times, I'm trying to upload maybe a batch of videos so I can yeah. at least have a consistent source of stuff coming out at least once a week. So that's been kind of my approach to it. Um, yeah. How about you, Curtis? I just kind of, so I guess I sort of fell into the live streaming thing back during the development of Starbound. You know, their coders would like stream their coding, right? They'd be like, <laughs> have their you know, Visual Studio or whatever up on the screen and they would, you know, make a change, run the game, see what it did. And it was really cool and it was pretty popular. And um, I remember that I was watching that. I was like, well, I could, you know, write when I'm writing music for these people. I could live stream my music. And it was kind of just like a one off, like, I'm going to try this and see what happens. And um, <clears throat> so I did it. And this was back in this had to have been like 2012, uh, 2011, somewhere way back there, back in the ancient days. <laughs> um, you know, I would, did this on like a like an underpowered iMac. Like it was like my poor computer would occasionally like literally just kernel panic and I'd have to reboot it because it was so, <laughs> you know, resource intensive to be running. You know, and this was back before I used like Vienna either. So I'm like running like, you know, trying to run Hollywood strings on an old iMac while live streaming it was uh, <laughs> often right. very, very technically difficult. Um, but I did it anyway. I just thought it was fun. And, um, you know, just because I that game happened to be kind of have a lot of, you know, people interested in it coming out soon. You know, I actually ended up with, you know, you know, 65, 100 people watching the stream uh, when I was doing that. And uh, it, it was really fun. I mean, I, I kind of didn't really plan it out. I sort of, you know, didn't really think about, you know, what it would be like to live stream. I just kind of did it. And it was really fun. And there were lots of people. Right. Well, you know, I finish up Starbound soundtrack. I hand over all the music. Um, you know, a few years later, the game comes out. It took them all, you know, they were in early access. So it took them, you know, a lot of time to get, get everything out. Cause they're kind of like updating a train while it's moving, you know, it's kind of difficult. Um, mm -hmm. and I decided, well, I should, I should try it again. And, you know, since then I don't get, you know, quite the same numbers just because I don't have this game attached to it, but I do have people that come in and, and see it. And, you know, it's changed a lot for me in the sense that there are sometimes when I really like to do it and sometimes when I really don't, um, I can usually mm -hmm. tell when I sit down to compose and I, you know, open up my template, you know, wait 45 minutes for everything to load. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> come back and I sit down and I kind of, 
you know, I can tell, is this going to be a day when live streaming is going to work or not? Um, because mm -hmm. there are days when, you know, I know that it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be one of those days where I'm just rewriting the same measure over and over and over again. And no matter what I do, I can't at least keep out of my mind to at least a small extent that like I'm here to entertain these people who are watching. Right. And so if I'm sitting mm -hmm. there rewriting a measure a hundred times, I kind of feel bad, even though I know that's not why they're watching. Um, you know, this is probably good to have out there so that people can see that, you know, it's not just, you know, hunky dory sit down and, you know, see beautiful flowers, you know, come out of your butt uh, <laughs> for your composition every, you know, like that's not right. what it's like. Sometimes right. you struggle. So it's probably good to have those struggles up there. Yeah. Um, but that's hard to live stream because you kind of feel bad for like, you know, you see four people in yeah. mm -hmm. chat or whatever and you're like, oh man, but I'm not entertaining. <laughs> so I, you know, going forward, I've sort of, for a while I tried to do a schedule. I was trying to do it, you know, three times a week and really Ooh. build the audience and blah, blah, blah. Cause you know, I'm, I, I usually have, you know, an hour or two on Monday, Wednesday, okay. and Friday that I'm doing something that I can live stream. So I, you know, the, and the idea was to just kind of, you know, turn it on, not really pay it, you know, not really worry about it too much, but I've yeah. found that I can't. So yeah, right. now I just do it when I feel like it, um, because mm -hmm. it's great. I'm happy to have this out there, but you know, it's some, there are some days when I just can't. And obviously when I'm doing some client work, you know, if I'm working on something unannounced, I, I can't live stream right. that because I would be announcing it. So that will often like in January, I was doing some motion graphic video and I haven't talked to these people about whether they want their, you know, client work live stream. So I didn't. And so that, that took me about two weeks and you know, so there's two weeks gone. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, you know, a lot of live streaming is really a, really a, a, a <clears throat> viable option for, mm -hmm. for working composers. I think it's a nice supplement. Um, and then as far as YouTube is concerned, I just upload what I do on Twitch to YouTube because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, you know, I don't even edit it. I just literally hit the export button and okay. move on. Sometimes I'll make a video or two on YouTube, but it's, it's very rare. So, you know, I, I'm not the sort of person who like goes at this as like, I'm going to build an audience. I'm going to really, you know, I want to be partnered, blah, blah, blah. Man, right. I don't really care. You know, I just all, I'll sit here and, and I'll live stream a little bit, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill myself over it. So. Yeah, I mean, for me, I actually started live streaming a long time ago, like on Ustream Day. So it's like 2008. And like, I would just oh, have yeah. get togethers and like a bunch of geeks mm -hmm. would get on there. We'd talk about video games and it was fun. And I'd have 10 people in there and it was the most fun I ever had online, you know, because it was just like a awesome. little small thing. And then, you know, it kind of grew and I started doing the Twitch thing and I started streaming and started getting a following. And then I, fi I figured, you know, I was like, well, my audience is on YouTube because that's where I do my stuff. So I, I tried the YouTube streaming thing. And, and Curtis and Chris, like you guys said, you know, it is nerve wracking. And when you have people watching you do what you do, and sometimes you're going to crash and burn. I crashed and burn on the stream, but people need to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, when I go to watch people's music streams, they're, I yeah, I want them to be entertaining, but I'm watching their process. I'm trying to try to pick up new things i might not know like oh look how they did that Ooh, i could try to implement that in my process so it's kind of a learning thing i always like to see what other people do and like i watch um there's a, a guy on youtube that i've been following for a long time he's an ambient guitar player and i actually uh added his live stream to uh the composer made simple discord channel it, he's not like a composer like us but he does compose music he does his band name is lowercase noises his name is andy othling I've been watching him for years, and he's the one that kind of got me into, like, hey, maybe I should try this ambient guitar thing, because it's kind of cool. And um, I watch his live streams, and I learned so much just watching him, you know? And, like, oh, I'm going to try that into my next piece. So that's more of what it is for me. It's, um, it's kind of... Uh, and it's, there's another thing about actually having people there getting real-time feedback. Like, if they're digging mm -hmm. it then you know I'm on to something here. Let's keep doing it. So they're kind of helping you compose a piece and giving you that feedback right away, which, you know, as we know as composers, what we do is very lonely. <laughs> you know, we're sitting yeah, in a room on a computer going, I think I like it, but is anybody else going to like it? You know, it's like you're doing this in the dark, which is our profession's really weird in that way. It but is very with, strange. It's yeah. very singular. It's one yeah. person. You know, it's not like, you know, right. it's not like a film where you're working with 800,000 yeah. people. Like even when you're literally working on a film, you're just 
off in composer land, um, right. you know, by yourself for most of it. But I, need I think that. it's interesting you mentioned like suggestions. Like that's actually one of the things I struggle with on Twitch because it's not that I don't want to take suggestions or I think that feedback is unhelpful in the middle of a process that is really hard for me. You know, yeah. I'll have people be like, sure. I hear you think there should be flute there. And I'm like, well, maybe. I mean, that's not a terrible <laughs> idea, but like, that's not where I am in my process right now. This is where I am in my process right now. Or like just the other day, I had this great guy. He was being awesome. He was being super active in chat. And at one point he was, he was trying to be helpful. And he's like, here, what about this chord progression? And I'm like, Ooh, you know, I, am I really composing the song if I use your chord progression? I mean, <laughs> I, right. I don't, I don't, I'm not. <laughs> um, so that's actually something about live streaming that I find a little bit interesting because it can be really helpful depending on what feedback you're getting. Like sometimes people are like, you know, I'm not sure that that transition works. That's super helpful. I feel like there should be flute there is kind of like, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, right. I, it's not, again, it's not that I want to be like mean to these people and tell them that their feedback sucks because it doesn't. Mm. It's that it's hard for me to, to do anything with that because, right. you know, uh, you know, I had another person in, in live stream who came in, made a billion suggestions and I'm like, you know, it's a good idea. If I'm not implementing them, I'm not trying to ignore you. It's just, we're in a different you know spot here. Yeah. Just left, yeah. just, just checked out. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> welcome welcome <laughs> you know, to live streaming. <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it, that's interesting for me. Cause, and that's actually one of the hardest things about live streaming for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know who is it that that electronic guy um, uh, does the does where's the mouse mask? Dead mouse. Um, does, yeah, yeah. He 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 used Dead to uh, yeah, stream. Did. Yeah, stream his um, sessions too. And I feel like he had the same thing where he's like, uh, you know, two thousand. Of course, he's super popular, so he's got you know like twenty thousand oh, yeah. people mm -hmm. in the chat or whatever. Um, but I, I I would find that just just. I mean, and they're all like, you know, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you should do that. And then it's just like, oh, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I, like, <laughs> I've seen it now. So if I do that, is it really my idea? <laughs> right. Um, that's the hardest part for it about me or well, the hardest part for me. The thing about live streaming is it, it's a two way communication. That's what I've learned. And the problem, the reason I stopped doing the live streaming thing is because um, I would spend too much time talking to everybody mm -hmm. and not composing and then people get upset well do do more composing less talking and this stuff like no we like having todd talk to us you know it's mm -hmm. so you get that kind of fight too which is difficult to balance and then at the end of the day like you're saying Kurt, curtis it's like dude you're the artist so at the end of the day you know the buck stops with you um you know exactly so uh, i yeah. totally get that um but i think as far as why this is a, a crucial thing for composers and youtube and content creation and being out there it's free marketing and you're getting your name out there and you're going to build a following you're going to build fans and so i think it's crucial in today's atmosphere and i think every composer that is wanted wants to do this full time wants to get their name out there it's free marketing you're not paying anybody to do it and it's tough well and you're also doing like demos for for prospective clients like yes. You know, I can point a client to a specific, you know, live stream archive on YouTube and be like, yeah, I do know how to do orchestral music. Here is me doing it. Right. <laughs> right? Like, I know mm -hmm. how to do it. Um, so that's that's also helpful. Yeah, I've been I've had jobs where people look at my YouTube stuff the, and the training stuff that I did in the, in the tutorials. And they're like, that's awesome that you know how to do this stuff. And, you know, because that's what I did it for. I didn't do it because I want to make money on YouTube. I did it as a challenge to myself is, well, I need to get better at training because what about if I have to come up with a training video that I have to shoot, edit, do it all myself? I need to know how to do that mm. for my job. So that's why I started doing it. It was more of a challenge. But I, I like doing YouTube. I really love it. I love the feedback, the community thing. But it's tough, man. Especially we got a lot like especially last year for me was a really tough year because I had a lot of projects and I didn't really have much time to do music and, and YouTube just kind of fell by the wayside. And I love doing it. I love doing the composing made or the compose made simple. The composer talks and the composing with coffee and all that was great. And that's how me and Chris met, actually. <laughs> it was in one of my live streams. I was doing a live stream and Chris yeah. was in there and then he sent me his piece and then it just snowballed from there. And then I got him <laughs> on composer talk and then here we are, <laughs> I, uh, you know. So but like Curtis, that's how I found you was actually on YouTube. I think I was looking up East West stuff and then your, one of your videos came up. And I watched it and then I, know, I, I found that you streamed. So I started, you know, just going into your streams and watching them all the time. And I, I remember specifically when we talked for the first time, Curtis, I was like kind of nervous because like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Curtis. You're like, I know this guy, but he doesn't <laughs> know me and because I, I, I follow his streams and I watch them. And I still pop in to this day when you're streaming. If I can, I'll go in there. I, I'm, a, I'm a lurker at the most time. I don't I don't really chat as much because I, I understand what you're doing because I'm a streamer myself. So I get it. 
um, right. especially with music and stuff. So I get it. But I'll pop in and say, hey, mm-hmm. how's it going, man? How you doing? Or say, hey, man, that sounds great. You know, and that's about it. But I, I just like to watch your process and because I learn, you know. So that's what I use mm. it for. But, yeah, I think, I think it's just like it's like a different, you know, if because if you watch regular streamers who are streaming like a game. Yeah. They're very interactive with the chat because that's like probably 50 percent of what their job is right is to be entertaining Mm -hmm. on screen and then the other 50 percent is to be entertaining and interactive i think that for us it works or at least for me like when i watch even other composers like it's so awesome by the way that in the composing made simple discord insert plug here (laughs) um there is this live stream bot and we've added like you know like 10 people to it or something and it shows when they go live so i go watch those people a lot whenever i see it and i see the same thing i think that sort of as a whole we're all sort of trying to figure out how does that live interaction work work? you know how what is the best way to do it and we're just waiting for someone to to kind of crack it for us because i do think that's a bit of a struggle right now yeah um and i think it's a struggle for a lot of the creative streamers too like even just going outside of music like if you watch the people who do art I noticed they kind of struggle with the same, yeah, the same thing of like, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to interact with you, but like, let's not critique something that's not even st- barely started, right? Let's let let's right. not tell me, you know, that's hard, and and that's hard, but I do think it is very valuable for people to see it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I've started like, I don't know why it's taking me so long, but I finally started watching Junkie XL's uh, oh, yeah. YouTube stuff, which is like astonishing that we have that level of access to like this triple a yeah. hollywood film composer sits down in his real studio and goes through the actual project files yeah. that he's mm. using to score films i mean that's insane um <clears throat> i think that's really really useful to see and to see that it's just a guy working in cubase you know this uh-huh. isn't he's not on some ascendant plane you know <laughs> right you know vomiting rainbows out and that's why he gets paid the big bucks <laughs> to do this is because he's good at this specific thing and it is i think that's really important for people to see that you know they're not the difference between you and junkie xl is is you know not as big as it seems mm-hmm. it's not as big as it seems he's he's just a human being who's very good at what he does and he's you just can connected. be good at what you do too he's just connected he's got the connections and he's, and he's been doing yeah, it for he years mm-hmm. he's been doing it for a long time he's so, been pulling that slot yeah. machine lever yeah dude and I th- to jump in here that you're talking about streamers to watch i think daniel james has ha- he's really mm-hmm. nailed it uh because he that got i mean he just blows me away i mean yeah at the level of stuff that he's doing sometimes it's not very complex and he can knock through a number pretty quickly but like dude just watching him create a piece from just like thin air and complete it Mm -hmm. in one live stream to me is so inspiring and and when i get in there and i can i compose like 15 bars and then i fall on my face i'm like jesus but like you know you have to do that and he just because he's professional he's doing this for years so he's got it down to a thing and i noticed and i'm thrown in here the other day I, i sat down and i wrote a rock tune you know i got this new acoustic guitar and I had this cool little riff, and I was like, all right, man, I'm going to see if I can make a song out of this. I nailed it in, like, six hours. Bam, I had a song done. I mean, all I need is vocals and clean it up and, you know, put a guitar solo. Duh, duh, duh. I don't sing, so, you know, I could get a singer and do it. But it, it's pretty much done because that's my medium. That's where I'm comfortable. But when it comes to, like, orchestral and all this, that's, you know, it's out of my thing. So I guess if I did a stream where I was doing rock music, I could probably handle myself a lot better, but what we, you know, when we do this composing thing and, and, you know, you have to really put time and effort and think about every little part and nuance. Yeah, it's difficult. Mm-hmm. It really is. But I think Daniel James, he's probably the best person to watch. Um, and cause he interacts, but yet he, he focuses, but he knows when he just knows when to do it. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. that he was probably my main inspiration and tipping point to live stream. And I was like, I'm gonna give this a try, but, I'm just like you, Chris and Curtis. Like it is very nerve wracking to open that door up, because like you're, we're artists, you know. So we're already like insecure <laughs> to the max. Right. Like my my stuff sucks, but you, when you have that feedback and you have people watching you and you have that real time, you know, thing, it's like it's probably not as bad as you really. You're just making it bad, but it is difficult and it's a it's a fine line to walk. And like, where does that thing? But if you haven't noticed, if you're on Twitch. A lot of the big dudes are starting to get on Twitch. I noticed um, the guy from – there's a, a metal guy. He's a guitar player uh, from the band Trivium. He's live streaming all the time. And now Herman mm. Lai from Dragon Force, he's the guitar player. He started streaming. Uh, you know, and then you said Dead Mew. All these – it's going to happen, man. In the next, like, couple of years, maybe if this year, you're going to start seeing big names, just like Twitter and Facebook. How Remember how celebrities got on and then basically ruined the platform? 
uh, <laughs> as much as basically what's going to happen here with Twitch. But I don't. I think Twitch. It works well on Twitch because Twitch is about personalities. You know what I mean? And it's about the individual and your stream. And people will watch who they want to watch. If they want to watch Ninja, if they want to watch, you know, whoever. Pick and choose. It's a bit of a digression, but I do yeah. think you're right that there's more big names getting on Twitch. But I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, who writes their own music and who doesn't. <laughs> because there go. uh, there's going to be people who don't live stream because, you know, they may come up with a theme or two, but yeah. they don't really write a lot of it. So I'm interested to see how that <laughs> They farm works. it out, you mean? <laughs> what? I didn't say that, Todd. I don't know what you are talking about. I don't have a, a composer sweatshop. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's essential. I think it's that's essential. That's an interesting thing. And I, I think that's, yeah, I think it's going to be really cool to see that. Again, I think the level of access we have right now to even, like I said, like Junkie XL or Dead Mouse or whoever is is crazy. I mean, it's just insane. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you get to, to just go literally be in their studio with them and watch them do their thing. Um, and, and, you know, if you watch a stream, sometimes they're doing that very thing that I get really nervous about. Like uh, the one dead mouse stream I watched, he was working on like a measure for literally an hour. Yeah. Um, and that's by the way, why he's very successful. Cause he sits there and just, it has the patience to refine and refine. But isn't and refine. that what we do, Curtis? Uh, like we're, right. we're, 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 we're breaking down that barrier where everybody right. has this notion of what a composer or what a, a rock guy or guitar player does. And in actuality, what you think is actually not what they do. And, um, and that's what I'm saying. We're breaking down that wall and that barrier. And that's why I started doing the, uh, the interviews on my YouTube channel. I wanted to get real composers, real composers. Mm -hmm. You don't know who they are, but yet they're doing it. They're making a living. And I wanted to break down that wall and say, because when I was coming up and I wanted to do music as a career, as Curtis could probably relate, because we're, we're pretty much the same age, we grew up at the same time, it's like, dude, it was a mystery. You know what I'm saying? Like, you oh, didn't yeah, know how anybody mystery. made a you living. You had no idea. Yeah, you yeah. had no clue. And now I feel like it, it's there, and it's like, man, dude, if we would had this stuff when you know back when t just 20 years ago, my life would be way different. But, you know, it, it, it's not. So it's so good that people get to see this and – you know, but I then, mean, and I would, yeah. I'd be willing to bet that, like going forward, it's even more professions too. Like right now, it's a lot of creatives, yes. I think, that are streaming their work. Mm -hmm. But I could actually, literally, like, I really do think that, like, maybe in five, ten years, you're gonna see like accountants, like walking through yeah. spreadsheets. Like, this is why I do it this way. And there'll be people who are super into accounting who are actually watching them do it live well, and like understanding what they're doing. I seriously do. Five to ten years, do. accounting people might not exist because they're all gonna be replaced by <laughs> AI. So <laughs> just let you know. Their jobs being destroyed by I think the, the, being you know, yeah. paved over by the AI revolution. I, I think yeah, the coolest thing is um, different professions. Like up truck there. drivers, just, man, they should be doing it because think about oh, that. Absolutely. That'd be so cool. There's certain That's professions that yeah that right. lend themselves really well to like live streaming. And and uh, and here we go. Like I've done the other side too. Where Curtis, you mentioned this earlier about people that play video games. I stopped doing the composing thing and I started doing video game streaming, which I love because it's mindless. I don't have to think about anything. I'm playing a video game and I'm being entertaining. <laughs> but no, I'm saying it's very mindless because, it, but it's tough. Trust me, streaming is not easy. Let's just get that mm -hmm. out there. It's not what everybody thinks it is. Oh, I just throw the camera on. I'll be goofy and you know people are gonna come and I'm making money. Dude, it is nerve wracking. It's hard. It's a lot of freaking. Well, and work. you have to be so consistent. I yes. don't understand how they do this. Like I, I was streaming I, three I days a week. Stream, yeah, yeah, I will live stream maybe once a week now. I tried the three days a week thing, and it was brutal. It's brutal. These people man. will do it seven days a week. I don't get that. But that's that, their job. That's oh what gosh. they do. I mean, eight <sighs> hours a day. Like, I was doing it in working. I was doing like I'd work. I'd start work at eight o'clock in the morning. I get off at two from my part time job, and in between there, uh, you know, try to do other work and do excuse me, do a bunch of balancing acts. And then from two to five, that's when I streamed. And it was just like basically go, 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 go all day, all week. And it was just mm -hmm. like, I got so burned out. I love doing it. And I took a little break and now I haven't been back streaming because, well, there's like other things happening, you know, personal stuff and uh, job stuff, you know, that might be happening here. So I can't stream the same time. But yeah, you got to be, con and th what I found out about Twitch is you have to be in that seat. It's not a passive income. You know, it, it, it's it's not like you just, okay, now I have this following. I'm going to make, no, you have to sit in that chair every day and do it. And it, it, it will wane on you. And now you can probably feel how celebrities and musicians feel all the time when just all that stuff at you all the time. It just, it's draining, man. So, yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, that's the downside of live streaming because then you're putting yourself out there. You're putting your real life out there. People really know who you are. Um, 
You know what I'm saying? So that could be that could be negative as well. And people want to be with you, which is great, but then they want more from you. You, mm-hmm. just, you know what I'm saying? So that's another oh, yeah, I thing. I get emails every time yeah. I stop streaming. Like, oh, why yeah. aren't you streaming? Yeah. Like, every time. Which is <laughs> like, dude, where were you? Yeah. Like, I've had four people email me. These are not the f- three people that were in the chat yesterday. Why aren't you watching? Where are yeah. you? <laughs> so that so I'm saying, like, there's good stuff, but then there's a lot of negative stuff that you got to be aware of. Um, you know, and people, when you put yourself out there and you're very consistent like that, people expect that. Cause like, you know, and uh, one thing I can say to you is if you're going to do live streaming, do what you can do, but you have to be consistent to make it work. Same with YouTube. And I know Cur- Chris, you're very consistent. I see all the time, you know, the discord, you're always throwing videos up. Right. And as I bet you, as you've been doing this now for the last year, you've seen your channel grow cause you're mm-hmm. putting all the content out there and it's always going to be there. So that's one thing I have to preference, you know, Start slow. Do not just think you're going to go do this and do, you know, three, five videos a week. Start slow. One video a week. One video every two weeks. One video a month. Okay. Try that first. You know, like us in a podcast, like we just do this once a month and it's tough just to do once a month, our schedules. <laughs> and, you know, but we do it because we love it and we love talking about it. And I just yeah. love hanging with Chris and Curtis. Like that's just, you know, <laughs> like that's just how it happened. Yeah. You know, it's like I love talking to the guys and, you know, we just have fun doing it. And we are hope we're helping yeah. people. Um but yeah, that's that's just I guess from somebody that's been doing this for years, streaming YouTube, it's like a full time job. At the end of the day, it's like a real job. Like it, you got to treat it like that. It's a business too. It's it's a business. But as a composer, here we go again, going back to composer thing. And the one thing that we're that veil we're breaking is you got to have your hands in multiple things, and that's why you're seeing all these people get on it because it's easy money for them because they already have a following. You know what I mean? Like Dead Mouse. Yeah. He's already got, you know, whatever he's got. So he throws on the camera, you know, and he just streams a couple of days a week. He's partner within a month. And then every time he has streams, so he's going to make money, you know, and people are going to donate bits, you know, are going to. And that's great because he's got that following. He's put the legwork in ahead of time. So maybe if you're going to consider streaming, wait until you have a little bit of a fan base then you're going to f- you're going to see more from it. You know what I'm saying? Cuz like Andy Olfling, I talked about him earlier. He's been on YouTube for over 10 years and he's built a huge following. I think he's got I think he's he's approaching 100,000 subscribers. And he's just an ambient Dang. guitar player, okay? And he just puts up little sketches and stuff like I used to do on my YouTube channel, which I want to get back into. Um and he just built a following. You know, he's got records and he does Patreon. There's another thing we can talk about Patreon as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's another way to support what you do. Um, and but he's got a following, so I've noticed when he went to Twitch because he's kind of if everybody's haven't noticed, YouTube's kind of getting a little funky, you know what I mean? Like, I'm kind of lost interest with YouTube, I still want to do it, but them as a company and the things they've been doing, it they they they, they focus on the big, big namers, you know, and it kind of kills people mm-hmm. like us, you know, that we know we're never going to be, you know, 500,000 million subscribers. I'm never going to have that, I don't need that, you know, I could probably have. 2,000 to 10,000 subscribers and be pretty well off it. That's a pretty good fan base. Think about if, what, 25% of them bought a, an album I put out. That's pretty damn good. Mm. You know, that's 500 people or whatever. So mm. maybe wait to do the streaming until you have a following. Or if you don't have any following, that's the best way to build one, you know, pretty quickly. Mm. So, and, and keep your expectation, expectations yeah. in check. <laughs> Let's just say that too. Right. You're not going to make a full time. You're not going to. You're not going to replace your income uploading YouTube videos. You can make decent money. The thing about YouTube, and what I've learned is, it's all about traffic. So you got to make mm-hmm. videos that are gonna people are gonna watch, and so solving people's problems is the best thing that YouTube does, and it always will be. I mean, yeah, they have those people that, you know, they do vlogs and all this, you know, entertainment stuff, which is great. And but if you notice those, it's like. Their video goes up, it's huge, it explodes, but then after six months, nobody cares. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you want to try to make pillar content, stuff that's going to hang around for five years, ten years. That's yeah, always going to be around that long tail, yeah. yeah. That long, yeah. So that's what I kind of did, and I, I kind of approached my video as more of a philosophical approach than instead mm-hmm. of like the actual Cubase thing. It's like, no use this philosophy towards whatever you're going to do. So that's kind of my strategy. But anyway. I mean, speaking of like money, I haven't made a single cent off YouTube yet, but (laughs) I, you know, we're in it long run because we're we're actually trying to help people. Right. So it makes sense to, to keep at something that you know, that will 
hopefully last and you know educational material is always something yes. that's going to be valued so and it's not about the money for you youtube is about building a following building an audience yeah so the because in oh, the future absolutely. it's going to pay off more yeah. dividends in the long run use i yeah. mean i don't i don't use youtube to make any money at all just like chris i don't i don't make mm -hmm. money I, I make zero zero dollars i think at the time that i was i think when it, when they did the great demonetization of yeah. tiny channels, um, yes. I think I had like 19 cents, and I've had my YouTube channel for ever. All right, mm -hmm, and and <laughs> and it's like, you know, that's not. I mean, unless you're making, unless you're getting like millions of views on a video, it's just not. It's not really worth it. So use it as a place. You know, like like I just happened to have exported my Twitch stream where I talked about Hollywood or um uh eric whitaker choirs and yeah. like that's to, to date like the best video i've ever mm. uh uploaded in terms of views um but it's more because i'm getting subscribers from that who are then watching live streams occasionally when i upload them and then maybe are going to buy an album or listen to me on spotify like right. that's where right, like that's where the value is yep. is hopefully that those people end up buying a ton dollar album Yep. Not that they came and watched mm -hmm. a video. It's not. That's not. That's not. You're. You're. What you watching a video is worth. I mean, I. I. You know. Thank you for watching. If you do watch, <laughs> but like monetarily, that doesn't get me anything. It's because it's the the ad. The rates are so incredibly low. It's oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, the marketing tool for you. It's yeah. it's like fishing. You're just yeah. putting it out there, and people. You're not gonna get everybody, but you're gonna get people to bite, and eventually they'll become fans. Yeah. And it's another really way to pull the slot machine. And maybe yep. you see it, random person. Maybe you know a music producer sees it. Maybe a person yeah. who works at a big, you know, an, an indie game. You know, sees you never it. know. Oh, I like this guy. Yeah, you yep. don't know who's watching. You never it. know who's gonna watch. So, you know, again, it's like I, I just mm. always go back to that slot machine analogy. If you want to get the jackpot, you're gonna have to pull that lever a lot. This is just one more way to pull the lever. Yep. You know, I should probably be exporting from Twitch, not just to YouTube, but to like Vimeo and every other place that I can possibly, you know, <laughs> right. plaster my name. Um, which is again why why I still to this day go by my actual name, not an alias, by the way. But that's yeah, that's, that's what you should do. Actually. No, you should. That's one thing I made a mistake on my main Twitch channel. It used to be Todd K Edwards. And then when I started doing the video game thing, um, I changed it. And now I'm kill kicking myself. It's like, dude, why did I do that? Just keep it Todd K. Edwards, mm -hmm. and you can do music. You could do video game. And that's another thing. Be variety. When you're, if you're going to stream on Twitch, you don't just have to do music. Do video games. Do other things. That's going to bring other people into your world. You know, you're going to get them in right. there. Hey, they're cool. I actually like this guy. At the end of the day, it's about if they like you or not. If they like you, they bought into who you are and what you represent, you got a fan. You owe it, you have a fan. Mm -hmm. And we've never had that ever before. You know, because think about it, if you liked your favorite band, like me, my band growing up in, um, in, in high school was either The Doors or Metallica, which is two totally different music genres, right? <laughs> That's why I'm weird, because, like, I listen to The Doors, <laughs> which The Doors is very jazzy, very blues, very rock, very just different. Like the door, there's no band to this day that's like the doors. Anyway, and then I like Metallica because I like heavy music and I like Guns N' Roses and all that stuff. But we didn't know who they were unless you read it in a magazine and you only got like, you know, what, like a brief glimpse of who this person really was. So you kind of formulated your own idea of who they were. And that's why they always tell you don't meet your heroes because <laughs> you're disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but nowadays that's all gone, man. Like you could really know who somebody is just because the level of, openness we have with youtube twitter facebook twitch <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's like mm -hmm. you can pretty much formulate who podcasts is. podcasts <laughs> i mean this is probably the best form because we're talking and like stories just come up things come up so you really get to know people and i love podcasts i think it's the best form we've ever had um you know mm -hmm. I, I love it well, awesome. I think that's a pretty good good, yeah. uh, good overview of that. So <laughs> I think the next topic we wanted to talk about was we wanted, you know, Chris was a little bit quiet during that. So that's good because <laughs> now we're going to sort of hand it over to Chris and he's going to talk oh about some of his more recent <laughs> music. And uh, while, while the rest of us, you know, take a listen and chime in occasionally <laughs> with, the, with the occasional accolade. So Chris, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks, Curtis, for that uh, dramatic introduction. Now I feel uh, a little bit nervous, but uh, that's that's the whole point of the show. So, so um, yeah, I mean, this this piece is it was basically made for a kind of a, a custom library, if you will. And one of my friends on Facebook, he's 
uh, going to do a, uh, I'll start a new library company with a friend of his. And so he reached out to me to ask if I could, you know, write a few pieces for it. So he wanted me to keep it, you know, basically a minute long or under. And so uh, this is kind of my first foray into the trailer type of music thing. <laughs> I mean, I, I did want to stay kind of orchestral. I didn't want to go too sound design because that's not my forte at all, and I have no really experience with that. So um, I think starting with a – like, I, I think I went with a bunch of cliches in this in this piece. So I used um, string ostinatos to begin, and I then I put in a percussion pattern, uh, some highs in there with, you know, some sticks and some clacking and that kind of thing to give it the, the air and definition. And then um, I think it was a 12 – 12 horns or six horns patch from center brass to give it that lead melody. Um, and I got a few comments uh, that liked the choir in it, actually. So um, I put in the choir from Metropolis Arc 1 to give it that bit of extra human element to it. Um, and then what else was there? Da, 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 da. I don't think there were any guitars in there, but um, there were strings, there was brass, not really any woodwinds, as, which is kind of typical, I guess, for this trailer stuff. And then um, in terms of the mixing, I just tried to keep it as basically clean, not too overprocessed. I didn't want it to sound like over compressed or anything. So I, I still wanted it to breathe. Um, I think dynamic range is quite important, even if you're doing trailer stuff that it, you know, you don't squash it completely. Um, and yeah, I just tried to have something that started kind of soft uh, dynamically and then basically grew as much as possible towards the very end. Uh, and Basically, one of the requirements was to end with a big bang, so uh, as well as on the downbeat. So instead of ending like ambiguously on a two or a three, um, I had to end on a one. So I just had to find a way to do that, and I think it, I think it turned out pretty well. So um, I chose the key of C minor. It's kind of a dark and brooding key. I mean, it's it also sounds kind of epic as well in and of itself. So uh, it's also nice for are, cello writing since your yeah yeah, yeah your yeah, yeah. tonic is on the on the low on that open string. It's lovely. Right, orchestration tip. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, no, but I think I think that's pretty much it in terms of like an overview of it. So um, I, I found it I found it quite fun to write because I could basically put down one idea and then I could basically loop it uh, using the logic that you just loop it over and over and then add in a layer at a time and then. You know, it just builds. So something we have to be careful of when we do this is that the low end doesn't become too overpopulated, right? So when you're doing the mixing stuff, just make sure you EQ out the the low ends um, a little bit, like, and consider how much mid range you have as well, because cluttering up the mid range is kind of something that's really easy to do. So um, I think a good technique for that is to kind of go into the instruments that you feel are taking up mid range but don't necessarily need that mid range. So you can take that out, and then that already automatically gives room to the other instruments to breathe, and then you can also boost, you know, the bits of another instrument if you really want to. But uh, it's all about the frequency balance, honestly. If it's mm -hmm. something is too much, then it, your instantly picks it up right away. So, one th yeah, one thing I, I've noticed about trailer pieces are it's you gotta have dynamics, you know, to make it work, mm -hmm. to make that epic feeling, you know, that build up that you're getting to. If you make the first part you know, soft and, and you contrast that, it, your piece is going to be more effective. And I think you said at the top, Chris, that, you know, you felt kind of bad, the piece that you wrote, because it's it follows all the epic music trailer tropes, right? But you kind of have mm -hmm. to do that, right? You have to learn the essence of those pieces, but then do it how you would do it. You know what I mean? But you have to have well, that. And I, yeah, I mean, and I, and I think that, you know, he's talking about music that is that has got a purpose, right? He's mm -hmm. starting with 
I know this is going to a licensed library of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 you know, if I, if, if my college professors heard me say this, they would, they would be very mad. So hopefully they don't listen. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Owen or uh, Dr. Browning. But, um, you know, when you are writing for licensed music, do not be fancy. It is not your job to be fancy. It is your job to be, to, to, to be a trailer piece that everyone has heard before. That right. is that is what your job is to do. That's what they want. That's what people need to hear. So, do, you know, using the trailer tropes is not just. I wouldn't say it's it's bad. I would actually say it's a virtue here because mm -hmm. that's what people want to hear. People are going to be listening to you know twenty, thirty, forty, fifty different trailer tracks before they decide on the one that they're going to buy. Especially if they're buying it like you know a license that allows them to do a lot with it and it's costing them a lot of money. Um, so the the way you're going to stand out is not always being super unique and a special butterfly. No, it's going to be to be hyper competent at that one thing. And to do that, you have to master the tropes. Right. So I, I think that's, that's the correct thing to do. I mean, a, a lot of stuff he talked about building to a single big conclusion that ends on the downbeat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to make an editor's job easier mm -hmm. when he throws it into the project. He's going to know exactly when that hit is going to be, um, you know, talking about looping stuff so that you have repeated ideas. That's very, very good because it gives the audience, you, know, you have what, a minute with the audience? Right. You're going to have to repeat a lot because you don't have time to, you know, introduce this giant extended two minute long melody that <laughs> is about <laughs> human existence. You just don't have time to do that. And if you, if that's what you want to do, go do something else because this is not your venue. Right. This right. is very hyper competent um, track. Now, you know, Later, I can talk about things I think this does better than other tracks, but but I just wanted to throw that in there that that is good to do, and that I would master those first because right. I am actually bad at that. That's really a struggle for me because when I feel like I'm doing something that's maybe a little too in the mold, I try to change it, and that that mm. that often wastes days of my life because yep. then I end up just going back and and changing <laughs> it. So just yeah, my we're, two we're cents. A lot Somebody alike, who Chris. writes a lot for libraries. Yeah. We're a lot alike, <laughs> dude. Like sometimes I just it's too simple. Well, yeah, it's got to be. <laughs> Simple is good. Keep it simple, stupid. That's my new mantra. Like, dude, just go with your first gut instinct. And usually that's pretty much yeah. right. So, yeah, I totally agree with everything Curtis said and Chris. And you got to know the tropes. If you're going to write for licensed music, trailer music, or whatever, pick your genre. You got to understand those tropes or, you know, those things that everybody well, about does. Things that do those tropes yeah. and are very successful. Yeah. If you look at them, um, they all do them, but then they're still good music. Like it is right. possible. Like the, the like it is a lie that you have to, you know. I can't write ostinato string patterns because that's too cliche. cliche. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna try to do this other thing. But go listen to like you know, uh, um, what are they called? Two steps from hell. It's yep, just string yep. ostinatos all the way down, but yet it's still good music and it still works. So, you know. Again, I go back to that quote by Stravinsky about the prison of infinite choice. Be happy you're not in the prison of infinite choice. You're in the freedom of being in a form, in a genre, in in a place where there's there's an established vocabulary. That's good because yeah. that gives you real freedom to make real choices within that and to be creative with it um, mm. instead of just sitting down and being like, you know – it's a sound design landscape piece of music <laughs> where I can do whatever I want. I mean, again, I, I, I sort of belittle that a little bit sometimes. I do think that people who do that often achieve astounding results, so I want to be clear about that. But um, I find that imprisoning. I find that just suffocatingly open to so many different things. So personally, I like this genre. I like it when there's rules and there's there's like a defined mm -hmm. vocabulary because it gives me a chance to truly be creative. Is that how you and felt doing it, it, Chris? Well, yeah, I mean, it just makes sense to uh, to start with the foundational stuff and then, you know, expand on it once you're very comfortable with it. So I, I guess for my case, um, I guess I had a preconceived notion of what Saw like a lot of orchestral trail music sounds like, so I wanted to, you know, kind of follow that mold this time and and see if I could, you know, do something similar. So, if anything, this was more of a practice for me, but at the same time, I wanted to have a little, you know, personal touch in there as well. So that was kind of the the goal of this one, in addition to having it for the library. But I, I guess a few of the typical instruments I I hear used a lot, and the ones I really like are, of course, the strings and brass, but also Ever since I've heard uh, the tubular bells used in a Michael Patti video, I, I love that mm -hmm. instrument. So it gives such a like a kind of an epic cinematic vibes, which yeah. I really like. And then um, 
I remember uh, that Toms video. Toms are great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was the Cine Symphony Light video. It was great. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, what, what else? Um, choir, of course. I mean, I just use these staccatos in Metropolis Arc 1, and it's great because they randomize whatever syllables the singers sing every time you press a note. So it's like round robins or something. Cool. So that that's pretty cool, too. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was really about just keeping it simple and, and trying not to overcomplicate it. And, of course, there were moments I did feel, oh, should I change chord here? Or like, you know, is this, is this too repetitive? Um, but I think, in general, it's... Like once you've established it, and if it's only a minute long, then there's no really much of a point to right. to you know experiment too much. That's what um, I was just gonna say. I was like, how long was the piece? Think about it. you're spending more time with it than your audience is gonna spend with it. Right. So you know you feel like you know yeah I got to do something else, but dude, a minute goes pretty quickly, and it's like uh, we're oh, not yeah. ready for something new. You know it's like just milk that what you got, <laughs> move some instruments around, change the colors up, and then you can milk you know one idea very well. Get good yeah. at that. Get good at that. Get good at milking ideas and making them interesting, think, you know? Yeah, and I think trailer music is really interesting in the sense that you do have a minute with the audience. And sometimes people will get to the end of something like a trailer or a promo and they'll be like, that, and they'll be super jazzed about that thing, like that movie, that video game, whatever. And sometimes they don't know why. And sometimes it's because you've you've written something that is so beautifully economical and efficient that it's got this perfect little hook that's just like, hooked them right in their brain and they don't even know it they don't even realize yeah. why and i've seen trailers that are terrible for things and that are not very well cut <laughs> for things that i'm not excited about but you get excited about it because there's that little hook that's yeah, that little that's... magic that magic it's why they put music in it right because mm -hmm. you can get that little hook in people's brain and and they don't even realize it it's 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 it should be almost illegal in the in the way that right. it almost kind of like gets into people's brains and reprograms what they think mm -hmm. about something and if you want to learn so, how to do that this is Listen to pop music. That's the best mm -hmm. way to learn how to Absolutely. get hooked. <laughs> Ab yeah, Do so not shy away from pop music. That will teach you so much. It will teach you so much hooks. how to write to hooks. talk to people. Hooks. Hooks. It's hooks. just hooks all the way down. Yep. I'll tell you yep. this one thing. One trailer that still sits with me today, I think it was for, it was either for Rogue One or it was for The Force Awakens. No, I think it was The Force Awakens. The piano thing not that every freaking trailer does now, that ding. You remember that trailer? <laughs> and then it was going in the Millennium Falcon was flying, and then it was doing the Han and Leia theme. Da, na, na. I got chills when I heard that. It mm -hmm. was like the best trailer I've ever heard in a long time. And it, I still love it, and I still go listen to it because it was just well-constructed. It hit everything that I wanted to hit. It teased the themes of Star Wars, but yet, you know, it did something with it. And it wasn't the trailer trailer thing, you know, like, dun, 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 dun. you know, it's like it had movement. It had dynamics. And I, th I think it was Force Awakens. It was like the second trailer or something. And it had the love theme. Da, 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 da. And when I did that, I was like, oh, my God, the hair stood on my neck. And you could tell somebody, you know, redid it. And it wasn't from <laughs> actual. I feel like uh, every Star Wars trailer, oh, after, like yeah. after there's been like a long hiatus, you know, like you know yeah. they won't make a Star Wars for a while, and then like ten years later they make a new one, and it's always like I feel like there should be someone at the beginning be like, hey, it's been a while since you heard the Force <laughs> theme, isn't it? Yeah. Well, here you go, because that it's just like so magical that it just like yeah. instantly cuts right to the middle of 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 what you think about it so think about it. they and, got their job know, done for them they got good material to pull from so <laughs> i mean another thing that that's that that trailer does specifically that i think also chris does is that it's clear it's very mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot of clarity yes uh you know listening to chris's trailer music i'm always you know obviously he's he's sort of starting to dip his toe in so I, when i say always i mean over the past you know few times he's done it um <laughs> every time i'm listening to them i'm always thinking wow i can hear all the foreground middle ground background layers and they're right. nicely balanced and they're even and they're clear it's not just a wall of sound that is yeah. that is that is smacking me over the face with itself um which i think is is something that goes very that is very underappreciated in trailer music these days and if you listen to really good trailer music and really successful trailer people there's always that idea that Within this notion of epicness, there is a clarity to the epicness. So you mm -hmm. know exactly the scale of it. It's not just 47 horns. I, ATO, by the <laughs> way, has a new library came out of 66 trombones. I'm so scared <laughs> of what you're going to hear out of that. I mean, I'm sure it's very good. But, mm -hmm. I mean, come on. 66 trombones right. is, is like – I mean, it's louder than a jet taking off. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're going to hurt people. <laughs> like your job is not to hurt people. It's to make yeah. them excited. And to make them excited, they have to understand what you're saying. Right. We're getting to the spinal tap levels here. You know, it goes to 11. You know, like my amp goes – it's like we're, we're getting to become a parody. 
you know, yes. it's like that we're getting to that point. But one thing I wanted to I wanted to touch on is you got to think of your who you're writing these trailers for the audience. It's like low common denominator. It's not people that are composers. It's not people that care about anything. You got to hold their hand through the piece. You have to show them what to what to care about in the piece. And like you were saying, Curtis, like I think the best trailer music does that. It knows where to go. Like it tells you where you need to focus, listen, you know, mm -hmm. what melody, what to concentrate on. And if you want to learn trailer music, like really good ones, like the 90s, man, there was really good trailer music in the 90s. Um, and even today, there's some, there's great stuff. But I'm just saying, like, that, and I think that comes from pop music. Like, you gotta learn how to hold them. Like, hey, the hook's coming. I can tell. Here, that, 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 yep. we're in there. You know what I mean? And <laughs> that's a valuable skill to learn. And you might think it's stupid, but. If you can put that into your music, your music will speak to more people. Well, if you're one of these you know? pretentious people that thinks yeah. that that's like lowbrow or something, um, a this is probably not for you. But b, I would consider, I would ask you to consider how many people have decided to like become musicians because they got excited about something as simple as a trailer track or a film score yeah. or a video game score, and like maybe that's mm -hmm. the work that this does that's important and that is that is maybe a little bit that's maybe a bit more intellectually challenging, I guess, for for people who want that. Like think about. Like what you can do with that um because it it's like a lot of people got into music because they love john williams or whatever right and and you know that, that's, 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 Im <laughs> that's important that's important that's important work so you're it like is. you're doing important good culturally significant things when you're even when you're doing a two-minute trailer track that has a lot of string ostinatos in it so. I guarantee you, if you study John Williams' music, he has a lot of stuff that he's borrowed from pop and jazz. I guarantee it. He's oh, yeah. a jazz yeah. guy. He's a jazz guy. All his voice yeah. scenes, all of his stuff is jazz oriented. So, mm -hmm. but I'm saying like his melodies, man. They talk to you. They speak to you. They're very simple. Usually under he usually starts a piece very simple. You know, it's like C G D one four five one four five one four five. Bam! Then he nails you. Oh my God, where'd that come from? Because <laughs> it feels like a magic trick. But he starts simple and builds from there. So right. that's something to learn. And like I said, you can learn that from pop music. Because we've heard one four we've heard one four five our whole life. But yet the music you've heard those songs, they're the same song being rewritten, but sometimes when you get a good song, it doesn't feel like the one four five now, does it? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we better get to these uh yeah, I know. these uh these things. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at the time for you, Todd. <laughs> So for the last part of our podcast today, we wanted to do our usual picks of the week. I think today we've mostly got up sample libraries that we've been looking into, purchasing, trying out. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Todd, who is going to give us a little overview and some, some of his thoughts on British Drama Toolkit. Yes, from so um, this was something they were having a sale, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And since I've been doing this ambient, kind of looking for more of that style, we, we I think in the last podcast, me and Curtis talked about the London uh, what is it? Contemporary orchestra textures, which we both purchased, by the way. And I've been using it, and I kind of really like it. It's got a really nice tone. Um, so anyway, when I saw that this came up for sale, I think it was one ninety nine or something like that. It was it was pretty cheap. And I saw a couple people talking about it, and they were like really excited about it that it was on sale. So I was like, hey, why not? Let's let's give it a whirl and let's pick it up. So I picked it up. Um, I've used it on a few things. Um, it's very specific. Uh, let's be clear there. So I can't really talk too much in depth, but from what I've used of it so far, um, it's in that Spitfire, you know, vein of like their kind of atmospheric kind of vibe thing, and it nails that drama really cool. So I could see if you're like if you're working on a drama film or you know or you need to put some drama in there, I could totally see that this library would be pretty cool, and it kind of gives you a um, a sense of it. Um, kind of out of the box, I guess you want to call it. So well, I'm going to open up. I got it oh, in front of me right now. So what it's all basically, it's all broken out into different folders for individual techniques. So they have a main one, which I think all the instruments are there. So what it has is violin, viola, cello, double bass, a bass clarinet, clarinet, flute, and piccolo. 
So I think it's kind of similar, Curtis, to London Orchestra, you know, the textures thing that we picked up, Contemporary Orchestra. It's it's mm-hmm. in that vein. So, like, you know, you just hold down a chord and it kind of will sustain it for you and it sounds beautiful. With this, like, perfectly beautiful sheen texture that just, yeah. like, lifts everything up. Yeah. Pretty much. You know what? I, I feel like a lot of Spitfire stuff has got that. It's almost like lemon zest in food. It just kind of, like, mm-hmm. pulls everything up. And yeah. So sort of like that. Exactly, and I, that's what I and that's why I picked up because it's like, at, I, like one thing the thing I've been coming to with like sample life is like I don't have that knowledge and I don't have the time to learn how to do all this stuff orchestrate you know it's like I just want to make music man so like this kind of does it for me it's like if I just throw a chord you know basic chord progression or something into it it's gonna do most of that cool work of orchestrating it for me which I know people are probably like ah you know whatever but. That's the world we live in, so get you know just live with it. Um, and they're doing it. You know the sample libraries are doing it for us, and because not most people know how to orchestrate. I mean, let's just be clear. Um, you don't really need to, but I mean, I don't know. The, whatever. That's a different conversation. But anyway, so I love it, and like I said, I, I've I've used it on like one track, and then they, they have a folder for for ensembles, so they break up the different you know into ensembles variants that like Spitfire does. So they have for a couple examples here, like in a Winwood. Wood, woodwind ensemble long, soft, so it's kind of that nice, you know, like soft pad, like I guess what Hans Zimmer strings does, you know, like that nice, lush, mm-hmm. you know, long thing that kind of like will have movement in it. And then they have a string ensemble, the exact same thing. And those are the two patches I used on the piece that I was creating. So like I said, I've just kind of got into this library, but from what I've used of it so far, it sounds really cool. And like I said, I picked it up when it was on sale, so I don't think the sale's there anymore. But it's one of those, it's kind of like the Olafur Arnold's composer toolkit. You know, it's very specific on what it does, but it does it very, very well. So it might not be, you know, if you need it for a certain project, for one little thing, it probably will work, but I'm sure you can find other ways to use it, but it's very specific. Gotcha. Sounds, sounds great. Sounds interesting. And yeah, I mean, it, I know, I know, we kind of give Spitfire a lot of crap on the podcast, but like I said, I own a lot of their libraries. I mean, because they make damn good products. I mean, you know. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I do feel like they have that kind of lemon zest feel to it, where you can really take something and it just knock it up just a little bit mm-hmm. with the with just some of their pads even behind stuff. It's yeah. kind of amazing, actually. They have vibe, um, man. They can get a vibe, they do. you know, and they you do. can put a vibe to your track if it's missing something and you need a vibe. You know, throw on some Olaf Arnolds, whatever, chamber strings yeah. or Evos or whatever. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, my pick for the week is from 8DO. This is actually from the 8DO V8P program. So unfortunately, it's not available to everyone. Um, the V8P program is uh, 8DO's sort of loyalty program where if you've, you know, given them tons of money, they allow you to buy uh, certain samples that are not available. So um, I don't think it's like a ton of money. I mean... It's a ton of money in the sense that it's like I think you know a thousand dollars or something. But um, you know if you're buying samples from them anyway, you, they kind of just throw you in there. Which is I, one day they just sent me the thing, hey you're in this. I was like, oh thank you I guess. And I haven't really <laughs> been paying attention to it a lot. But uh, they had this super string thing came out. And it looked kind of interesting, so I went and I looked at it, and it is fantastic. It is super unique. What they've done is they've hired a master luthier, a uh, person who builds string instruments, to build them a custom bowed string instrument. They they have no pictures of it on their website. They say they want you to focus on the sound and not on, um, you know, pictures of the instrument. They kind of want you to just kind of build, you know, use the sample as if the sample itself is the instrument, as if there is no real instrument. Um, and it's got this gorgeous boat sound it's got a huge range i mean the range is like think of like a cello plus maybe the top range of a viola because it goes pretty high i mean it actually probably goes well into violin territory so i don't know how many strings this thing has or um what they're doing it's obviously got some sort of metallic elements going it's it's really focused on um the tail of the sample so they'll they'll have this beautiful bowed you know, sound at the beginning of the note. And then as they let go of the bow, you get this just, I mean, infinitely long um, sympathetic vibration with the body of the instrument plus all the strings. And I, you know, I, I haven't bought 8DO stuff in a while, but um, I was very, very impressed with this. So if you if you are in the V8P program, you know, or you're thinking about pulling the trigger on one of those, um, you know, big sample libraries that gets you kind of into that automatically, um, 
I, I would check this out. It's it's interesting. It, even if you aren't in the program, I'd go onto YouTube and look through it, look at their walkthroughs because it has some just gorgeous sounds. And it's only right now, it's only like a hundred bucks, which is pretty amazing. So anyway. Yeah, so my pick of the week was um, Cinematic Studio Breast from Cinematic Studios. And um, I specifically picked it up because I needed a horn, a solo horn that was a little nicer than the solo horn from Cinebrass and uh, what I had from Berlin Brass. I mean, those two are really nice, but it's uh, the Berlin Brass one is not quite detailed enough, and uh, the Cinebrass one, it doesn't have quite a, enough of a dynamic range. So I looked at uh, CSB, and then I found out that because I had CSS, I was eligible for a discount, so I picked out the package, and I plugged it in, and I played with the solo horn, and it's really, really good because it goes from like PP to like triple F. Um, that's kind of the big standout feature of this library. It's like the, the dynamic range is super consistent across all of the patches from like PP to triple F. And um, so you can do it for anything from, you know, ballads and stuff or to your most aggressive trailer pieces because they come with ensembles as well. So uh, it's a very realistic sounding library, super playable. Um, so something I don't think you should pass up if you are writing in the vein of, you know, John Williams or something that is romantic and lush, this library excels at that kind of thing. So, um, and, and for the price, it's really unbeatable, I think, because I, I think it's one of the best, best brass libraries today on the market. And, uh, for that price, it's a no brainer in my opinion. So, um, yeah, I mean the, the, and what's really cool about it is that it can stand on its own as a solo library and as you know, a library where you blend in the instruments with other things. And not a lot of libraries can do that. They either function well with solo libraries or, you know, with an ensemble function. But in this case, it's really exceptional. So uh, have yeah. a look at that. I was. Uh, this has been, everybody's been talking about this for, like, I think the past couple of years, because I remember I have Cinematic Studio strings and solo strings and the Cinematic Studio piano. And I mm -hmm. love studio strings. Like, they just have that... And I know you use them, Chris, they, that lush. Mm -hmm. And if you like pair them with like Cinna strings or whatever, like a really more crisp yeah. defined, it just, yeah. they just sound really good. So yeah, I was mm -hmm. really curious to hear your thoughts on um, the Studio Press. I didn't pick it up because I wanted to, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get the discount too since I own those libraries. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I just have so many brass libraries. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. you know, yeah. at the point, it's like, oh, do I really need another one? So I, I just right. been going out and getting more unique libraries, you know, more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. unique and... And, and I was thinking the same thing. I was comparing the actual tone of the library to Cinebrass. And while I like the Cinebrass tone more from the Sony room, I think the actual playability of this library and the legatos are even better. And um, just the just the overall playability makes it so easy to come up with a line that you like in like one minute. Honestly, it's so, it's so it's it's vastly improved from other libraries that I own. So that's good. Well, yeah, I think yeah. Cinebrass is pretty old and i know they revamped it, it a few times it's like eight years ago <laughs> yeah so <laughs> the scripting old, so. you know that it's just gotten better with most right. libraries so yeah right all right well i think that will do it we hope you enjoyed this episode feel free to please leave us a review if you're on itunes below that helps us with our ratings also if you want to know more about us head over to composingmadesimple.com and you can find all the information where you can find me chris and curtis online Again, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your support and look forward to talking to you again soon.